Today, our topic is High Performance Data Science with Rapids, and we are pleased to have with us Zahra Ronaghi from NVIDIA. Zahra Ronaghi is a System Software Manager on the AI Infrastructure Team at NVIDIA. She is primarily focused on GPU-accelerated machine learning and integrations of rapid libraries with cloud uh, service providers and uh, machine learning platforms. Prior to joining NVIDIA, Zahra was a postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory where she worked on performance optimization of a tomographic reconstruction code and deep neural networks for uh, neutrino telescopes. Now, I would uh, encourage you to ask questions during the talk. Uh, one way, just type your questions in the chat and I will interrupt her after I collect a couple of questions or uh, you can just unmute yourselves and ask questions. During the talk, I highly suggest you to unmute yourself so uh, and we can enjoy the talk. Um, Zahra, thank you so much for joining us. Please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Yasi. Um, good morning, everyone, um, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, like Yasi mentioned, um, I'm an engineering manager um, on the Rapids team. Um, so today, I'll mostly just give you an overview of Rapids, uh, what Rapids is, what we've been doing recently with some of our libraries and software packages for data science. Um, and then I'll mention some of the core libraries within Rapids too, um, the three main ones. Uh, we have other libraries that we're working on, but um, I thought this would probably make sense for this audience today. Um, and again, feel free to stop me and ask any questions, um, and we can take some time at the end, 10, 15 minutes, to discuss any of these questions as well. All right, let's see. Okay. So um, a little bit of an overview, Rapids at a high level. It's basically an open source software suite of libraries that are really designed to accelerate data science by running entire pipelines on GPUs. It started at NVIDIA, but um, it's an open source project. So there's a lot of other groups uh, and collaborators that are working on the code and contributing to the code base. Um, and, and first, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about how we're trying to avoid extra copies or communication to host and how we're accelerating end-to-end -end workflows. Um, and then again, like I said, I'll cover the building blocks of this framework or platform, mostly focused on data frame and machine learning for today, but I'll briefly mention our graph analytics package too. All right, so looking at the data processing evolution, we've been using Hadoop for handling large distributed files. Um, however, one of the downsides is you'd have to read from HDFS, run some processing, and then write the result of each part back to HDFS. So you can think of each stage of the job, you'd have two I.O. barriers, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're querying and then running an ETL and then machine learning, um, you'd have to write to HDFS and read back from HDFS. And so after that came Spark, which tries to hold everything in memory to eliminate some of these I.O. barriers. Um, and then as, as a result of that, you end up with faster processing since it's reading straight from memory now instead of HDFS at each stage, and you'll end up with a reduction of total runtime. But then the next step was we can even do uh, better than this, we can process some of these libraries on the GPU. Basically, we needed something to accelerate how we process data and do traditional machine learning. Um, and so what we've been doing is we're working on accelerating these pipelines and computations on GPUs. But as you can see here, we were still spending some time to um, read from CPU, then write back to CPU again read it into GPU and then run another process. So here, again, there's like this communication overhead that's going on that even though our computation can be fast on the GPU, we're still spending some time and penalty um, on this overhead. Um, and this is, a, again, another figure that talks about the same thing that I just mentioned. So let's look at what initially was happening. Let's say we have two applications. Here it's labeled as just app A and B. One can be for machine learning, another one let's say simulation. Both run on GPUs today and offer great performance and acceleration. But after we load our data onto the GPU for app A, 
after the processing that whatever we need to do with this application, we'd have to write it back to host. So we're copying it back to CPU memory uh, to change our formats and then load it again back to GPU for another application. And so this is what traditional data analytics would look like. Uh, we'd have to copy and convert data formats. And the reason for that was that usually these apps couldn't directly communicate on the GPU. Um, and this just caused too much back and forth movement. So what did we want to do with Rapid? Uh, the question was, what if we could keep our data on the GPU, eliminate this communication overhead, so once our data gets loaded on the GPU, app A and B, for example, should be able to communicate. They should be able to pass the data around. And we want to be able to concatenate a bunch of these operations and leave the data on the GPU. Um, and so this would allow us to remove that too much and extra uh, communication overhead. Um, and this is basically the whole idea of rapids. And one of the reasons that we like to accelerate workloads end to end. So once you load your data, if you need to run any pre-processing, ETL, and then if you need to run some machine learning, let's run that right after since the data is, again, still on the GPU memory. Um, and then if you need to use like a deep learning framework, which I'll talk about too. But the goal is it's a little bit different than, you know, some of the traditional let's say HPC workflows that you could just accelerate one piece of your code. With this data science acceleration, we're trying to do this really end to end. Uh, so this is actually what led us to Apache Arrow as well. For those of you that are not familiar, really high level, what Apache Arrow is, it's a language in hardware agnostic columnar data structure. Um, it, it, all really started before GPUs too. It allows you to do interesting things on CPU as well without having to serialize and deserialize your data. And so similar concept for Rapids, we wanted to implement a mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly error-based memory model on the So the great thing is that other applications, if we have other libraries, other applications, they can also read and support this error format can now also read directly from pointers on device rather than copying data back and forth. So let's say if you're using Rapids libraries and then PyTorch, for example, you'd be able to pass your data between the two without an extra copy back to CPU. All right, so where do we see this data process evolution is going? We're not just eliminating IO bottlenecks and PCIe bottlenecks, but we also want to eliminate any bottlenecks of serialization and deserialization between these libraries. So this is where we see Rapids going. Um, if you notice here, we've eliminated this extra copy and converting back and forth between CPU and GPU. Um, and then depending on the data and the algorithm that we're using, we've seen up to 50 or 100x improvement. So I'll show you a couple of benchmarks too, but basically the whole idea is that GPUs have quite a few threads, they have high memory bandwidth. So if you do have applications that are able to use these common memory formats and pass references back and forth between the two APIs or many APIs that you're using, you can get huge performance improvements. All right, so let's, before I show you the Rapid stack. Let's look at you know what the traditional Pi data ecosystem looks like. Um, this is this might look familiar to you if you're already using pandas for you know data cleansing, exploration, analytics. Maybe you're using Scikit-Learn for machine learning, and then NetworkX for graph analytics. You might have heard of Dask too. Um, if you're try if you have data larger than a CPU, and if you want to distribute your data across multiple CPUs and multiple nodes. Uh, Dask is a nice way to be able to do that. And so this is what the Rapid software stack looks like. So if you compare the two, it looks very similar. Like I mentioned earlier, we built Rapids on top of Apache Era. So it's a bridge between all of this traditional big data and this new GPU accelerated platform. We have our three core libraries here that are built on top of Apache Era. So QDF and QIO, which are 
Um, our analytics library is similar to pandas. If you want to, let's see, if I really compare the two charts, um, similar to pandas, uh, the API, again, is very similar, and we'll see an example of a code too. And then QML, which is our machine learning library, and then QGraph for graph analytics. Um, again, we also use Dask to scale up and scale out for larger data sets. Um, and then, like I said, the best part is you can use these libraries in Python and not have to worry about CUDA C++ code. So we'll see the software stack for a couple of these libraries, but underneath, everything is implemented in CUDA C++. Um, and then we have Python wrappers exposed to the user. Um, so if you're familiar with some of the HPC applications, if you're writing CUDA C++ today or OpenHPC or CUDA Fortran, you don't have to worry about that. We're writing these Python wrappers for you uh, so you can import different libraries and take advantage of GPUs. All right, so here's the first benchmark that we actually published. Um, we use XGBoost and QDF in Rapids. It's a mortgage workflow from Fannie Mae. Um, if you've been following Rapids, uh, you've probably seen this. Um, this was actually about maybe two and a half years ago, and I'll show you another chart after this too. But just to give you an idea, what we wanted to initially work on was just uh, present how we can use QDF and XGBoost on the GPUs. So we chose this workflow. Um, every month, Fannie Mae puts out a file that contains mortgage that was given, um, debt to income ratio of the customer, where they live, how well they paid previous mortgages. So we used 200 gigabytes of this data um, with XGBoost to train and then ran a predictor on other mortgages that we didn't have information about. So the top of the charts, we use CPU um, and Spark. And then for Rapids, we ran this on a DGX2. So um, that's 16 V100 or Volta GPUs. Um, and then also we looked at five DGX ones. Each DGX one has eight V100 GPUs. So five of those uh, equals to 40 V100s that were hooked together. So if you uh, look at this, um, at the end, so this is end to end. It took about three uh, minutes. Well, it took about three minutes to train on a DGX2 and about half an hour on 100 CPU nodes. And then in general, if we look at end to end, it took about 200 seconds on the five DGX ones and about 300 on the DGX2. So we were able to load our data, prepare the data set, um, and then train and predict. Um, and get the outcome faster, that we were able to load and get the data even ready on the CPUs for the next part. So this is just one example, and the reason I show this is to get to this other slide, that this is showing Rapids improvement and optimization over time. So we do add functionalities and algorithms with each release, but what we do is we also profile and figure out where else we can accelerate and improve on. So if you look at this, this is Rapid.2, so the second release of Rapids, and then comparing this to .10 and then 17, which is actually, as of today now, uh, our previous release. Uh, so we're in the process of .18, that should get released today or tomorrow. Uh, but basically the whole idea is you can see the improvement um, as, as we, you know, work on the next version, we optimize our code too. Um, and then another thing is, since the last couple of releases, we've added support for the latest GPUs, like A100s or Ampere uh, GPUs. All right, so just another benchmark. Again, uh, we're calling this GPU Big Data Benchmark, or GPU BD. It's derived from the TPCXBB benchmark, which is a standard big data benchmark that includes ETL, data processing, plus some of the machine learning workflows. Um, again, we ran this on 128 A100s, took about 15 minutes, uh, compared uh, to some of the other workloads that were running in hours on the CPU, so we were able to run ETL with QDF, QML for machine learning, and then we're using Dask and UCX libraries for communication. Um, so there's, again, a lot of optimization that went into this code. One thing that we did really enable was that 
We've enabled DAS to use main memory and spill from GPU to CPU memory for some of the larger workflows. So that means it can use CPU memory as temporary storage if we need to. Uh, but then again, if you're interested, all this code for this benchmark is also available on our GitHub and you'll be able to look through it. All right, so that was just a little bit you know, of an overview of some of these benchmarks before we go into the libraries. Uh, what I'll do now, I'll talk about QDF first. Before I do that, I want to pause and, and ask if there are any questions you all see in that. I don't actually see any questions in the chat. I would encourage the audience, if you guys have questions, please go ahead and you can unmute yourself at this time and ask. All right, if yes. not, we can just take questions at the end too. Yes, thank you. Sure. All right, so a little bit about Kudia, um, and we do get asked this question sometimes that, do we really need a GPU accelerated data frame library? Um, and the answer is yes, we've seen average data scientists and engineers spending about 80% of their time in ETL feature engineering, as opposed to where they would want to spend that time, which is usually training these models, fine tuning, optimizing them. So if we can reduce data processing time, then in return, you'll have more time to explore different models um, and fine tune them. So QDF is our data frame library that accelerates loading, filtering, and manipulation of data. So again, we'll see part of this code, but if you're accustomed to importing libraries like pandas, this is pretty much the same. You can call functions that are, again, very similar, and it does have a pandas-like API. So looking a little bit at the software stack, so here we see we have the CUDA C++ implementation, which is called libqdf. Um, you can use that directly too if you're interested. But then on top of that, the Python bindings, which we're calling this QDF, and it's the interface to C++ that mimics the Pandas API. Uh, anywhere that it doesn't, that's something that we're working on. Um, and then at the top here, you'll see DAS QDF which I'll talk about too, but we use that to distribute larger data sets across nodes and GPUs. Um, and then again, QIO, which is actually part of QDF, but I, I just wanted to point this out because we have some GPU accelerated readers and writers too for different file formats like CSV or Parquet. Um, and this can also to support different types of decompression. So let's say if you have a CSV file and it's GZIP or BC2, or other formats, you can directly load it into GPU, decompress, and then start your ETL right away. Um, and so this is just, again, shows a little bit when we added some of these readers and writers. So the, this number in front of MS graph is released. Um, but again, this is so just an example. If you were using pandas, let's say read a CSV file, um, and then just you know look at the number of rows in that data set, you can do that with pandas. The only difference is if you wanted to do this on the GPU would be to import QDF now and then use QDF.readCSV to load that data into GPU memory. Um, and so for this like simple operation in this couple 1.9 gigabytes of data, um, it takes about 30 seconds to uh, use pandas and run this on the CPU. Whereas it can, you can do all of this in a couple of seconds, so two seconds. Um, and then again, you might see a mention of GPU direct storage, uh, if you're familiar with it. Um, if not, it's basically we call it GDS2. It's just another way to maximize, maximize your IO throughput and reduce any IO bottlenecks. So we're working on integrating this with Rapids as well. Traditionally, you what you would have to do is load your data from storage and you'd have to make a stop through CPU. We're trying to avoid this extra copy and make a direct path to GPU. So with GPU direct storage, we can make a direct path that comes straight in, for example, through a switch, and you can still use CPUs to set up your computation. But then after that, most of the work and data movement comes straight to GPU. All right, so another benchmark, this, this one is just focused on QDF. Um, so we're comparing QDF and pandas. 
this is using uh, rapis.13. We, uh, we should update these soon with the next release deck. Uh, but basically, we just set up basic data frames with two key columns and value columns. For some of the common operations like merge, sort, group by, we get better performance for larger data frames too. Uh, so this is, we looked at two data sets with 10 million rows um, and 100 million rows. And this is your GPU speed up compared to CPU. One thing that I should mention that's pretty critical in these benchmarks is RMM. Uh, I won't go into detail, but it's our Rapids Memory Manager. So we've enabled uh, RMM pool, which means we're using to basically uh, create a pool allocator to make CUDA device memory allocation and deallocation faster and asynchronous. Um, I won't go again into details, but the repo um, is open source and available on our GitHub if you're All right, so another thing briefly to mention is we've also added string support in QDF. Uh, this was one of the use cases is in NLP applications that we got a lot of requests for. Um, initially, it was a separate library, uh, so you might have seen mentions of NVString or QString, but we then migrated those functionalities into this more user-friendly data frame API. So we also adopted the Apache Arrow format for strings too, which resulted in more efficient memory use and we saw better speed ups. So now we have support for, for example, tokenizers, upper, lower, concat, slice, and some of these other operations. So you can now use a complex string and text manipulation for NLP applications on the GPU. And finally, another thing related to QDF, what we've been working on um, and aiming for in general for Rapid is really interoperability. We're not planning to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to replace existing libraries. We're, what we're doing is we're mimicking uh, these APIs um, and we're really focused on complementing those. So complementing some of these data science packages that exist today. So um, for example, if you're using some of these deep learning packages like PyTorch and you have a deep learning focused workflow. And then you think of you want to use potentially CUDA for some of your pre-processing. You can use CUDA array interface to go between these libraries without extra copies. So CUDA array interface, really what it is, is just a standard format to describe a GPU array. And it allows it for sharing between different libraries without copying and converting data. So like just you could use NumPy and Pandas in the same workflow today, you can now use QDF and QPy together while keeping your data entirely on the GPU. Um, all right, so this is all I had for the QDF section. What I'm gonna do is go into QML a little bit. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the goal is to be able to import a GPU library, for example, in this case, QML, run some machine algorithms on GPUs without having to write CUDA code. Um, of course, sometimes it's just you can import QML and use the same function, but sometimes you might require changing some of the parameters or keywords that might not exist in scikit-learn. So the vision of QML is really a GPU accelerated version of scikit-learn. The API, again, very similar, and it can use QDF data frames as input. It's not a requirement, though. So if your data is on MPy or Pandas, you can still use that to then train on the GPU. So if you don't need to do any pre-processing or ETL that you could you know, accelerate that on the GPU, you don't need to use QDF. You can just directly load your data from NumPy or Pandas into a QML model. Dr. O, we have two questions. Sure. So Zaki is asking why reading a CSV file on GPU is faster than CPU. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great question. So two things. That uh, example that you saw, uh, we're reading the file, but we're also uh, reading, looking at the number of columns in that data, so two operations. Um, and it's basically how we're really transferring our data um, over. So we're doing a, a CUDA mem copy, um, so creating this buffer. And that's where the RMM allocator comes into play, too. 
Uh, but I can share more information about that after. It is actually one of the advantages of RAPID, some of these accelerated GPU readers, although they're mostly focused on tabular data, so you can think of CSV or Parquet, um, but we should even see better acceleration with GDS too. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, does RAPID work with non-NVIDIA GPUs? So the answer to that is no. Uh, unfortunately, um, right now we just support um, NVIDIA GPUs. Thank you. Sure. Um, great questions. So following um, into the QML software stack, uh, looking at this similar, again, at the bottom we have CUDA, um, then the top layer that's exposed to the User again is Python. We have Cython wrapping C and C++ connects to Python. Um, our core algorithms are actually built in a combination of some of the existing CUDA libraries like Trust, QSparse, QSolver, and then we have our machine learning primitives, which are again in C++ initially. So these ML frames are actually the building blocks of basic operations that make bulk of machine learning. So you can think of core linear algebra, distance functions, matrix multiply, norm, transpose, things like that. One thing that we are working on is wrapping these primitives in Python as well. So if you can think of a algorithm that you're, uh, you want to work on, and if it's not, if we haven't implemented it yet, or if it's not even in our roadmap, then you would be able to use these building blocks um, and write another model based on that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, all of this, of course, kind of connects down back to CUDA. And we use Dask with QML as well to distribute our data for training across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes. Uh, so this is just um, an example of a CPU-based clustering. Um, let's say we're using Pandas um, and DBSCAN from Scikit-Learn and you want to port this to GPUs, what you can do is just basically now import QDF instead of Pandas um, and then QML um, instead of Scikit-Learn so you can import DBSCAN from QML, let's say. Uh, so I will say though I agree that this is a simple example but a lot of what this is what we're working towards a lot of our algorithms are as simply as importing QML, uh, but sometimes you might see a deviation in some of the examples. You, we might not fully support it yet, or sometimes additional parameters that we're adding for GPUs. Um, one that I can think of is uh, we have a parameter in one of our algorithms that you can define how much of the GPU memory, but usually they're very similar. So looking at a couple of uh, benchmarks for QML2, we see ranging from 10 to 20 um, and then up to 100x faster training on a single V100 compared to a dual socket CPU. Um, and then again, this depends on the number of features that were used and how large is our data. So again, for uh, 1 million rows, 2 million, 4 million. Um, usually with larger data, we see better speed up and better performance. And the reason for that is that we're fully utilizing the GPU. So that's where uh, the, we see um, more speed up comparing that to the dual CPU implementation. Um, and then for us inference library or fill, which we added that a um, couple of releases back that can accelerate prediction for random forest and boosted decision trees. Um, you can take either data stored in CPU memory, like NumPy arrays, um, or you can use GPU arrays. What it does is it basically takes the same model, loads it in, um, and it allows you to run inference much faster. Um, and so again, for large models, we've seen 23 or 36x speed up on a V100 uh, compared to CPU. Um, and then next boost. this is one thing that I mentioned um, about our benchmark initially too. It's actually the first algorithm that we release and publish for 
multi-GPU and multi-node support. Um, if you're familiar with it, you might have heard of it through DMLC. So that's actually where um, ExtraBoost on GPU was first developed. So what we're doing is we're really working closely with the ExtraBoost community. We work with them to add multi-GPU and multi-node support. Uh, and now what you can also do is if you install it from the main branch, you can load data from QDF and QPy. Uh, so initially we weren't able to do that. We'd have to load our data with pandas and then convert it to a GPU data frame. Uh, but right now with the most recent releases, you're able to just directly pass your QDF data frame into Extra um, And again, so we use Dask to scale up and scale out for larger data. The difference compared to QML algorithms is what you need to do is just change one parameter to be able to run on the GPU. So this is GPU HEST, is if you look at your parameters in XGBoost, uh, on the CPU it's just HEST, so you're using histograms, and then on the GPU you can modify that to use GPU HEST, you'll be able to run um, on the GPUs. So a little bit different, you don't need to import a different library even, just need to change one parameter. What we've also done recently is we've integrated Rapids Memory Manager, so RMM that I mentioned earlier. Um, and what that will do is that can decrease memory size by two thirds. All right, so another part that we've been working on is uh, hyperparameter optimization or HPO, which is basically a search on the hyperparameter space to find the parameters for the best model or higher accuracy, depending on what you're looking for. So we're integrating with some of the hyperparameter optimization tools like Raytune, MLflow, Uptuna. For example, uh, MLflow is really designed to snapshot your training code metrics and training trained models. So then you can query these later and find the best model to deploy for production. So again, since all of these work with scikit-learn today and QML has a similar API, these generally just work out of the box. Um, and so we've spent a little bit of time investigating these um, and then running some of these on the clouds as well. So you see an example of SageMaker, Azure ML, the Google AI platform. They have frameworks that are already implemented today to run HBO on what we've been able to do is just change that backend instead of training on the CPU, what's I could learn to train on GPUs with QML. So there's plenty of examples and video demos to run these as well on our website, so rapids.ai slash HPO. And a benchmark that, again, we initially published was uh, running this on uh, Azure ML, for example. Um, and we saw we were able to train 25 times faster with 7x reduction in cost uh, to run our HPO job um, on Azure. And so briefly, here's a table of the machine learning uh, functions that are accelerated today. Uh, extra boost at the top that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then some of the other ones are linear regression, logistic regression, random forest, k-means k and n. Most of these support multi-node and multi -node day as well. Um, and so if there's anything that you see here uh, that you're using today, great. Um, you can take advantage of that. If there's something, if other algorithms that you're using that are not in this table, feel free to go to our GitHub repo. You can submit a request or let us know. We would like to hear about those. And then um, SHAP, just to mention this because this is pretty exciting uh, and, and it's really new um, model explainability for GPUs. So if you're familiar with it already, um, it's mostly used for producing, but once you produce hundreds or thousands of trees in these models, um, which a lot of times you want to be able to explain it at the end too. So how or why you got these results. And that's where really SHAP comes into play. You can explain single predictions with a force plot, for example, which will show contributions of different features. So we've been accelerating these on the GPUs as well. Tree shaft, GPU tree shaft was added in XGBoost. So again, if you install XGBoost, the latest one, I think it's 1.3, uh, there will be a feature you, you'll be able to run shaft on the GPUs. And then we're also working on kernel shaft, which will get released with 
graph is dot 18, so it should be out in a day or two. All right, so I guess I'll pause here again uh, before I go into KuGraph, but I just have a couple of slides here, not a whole lot um, on KuGraph. Um, and then I have a couple more slides on Dask on GPUs um, in case anyone is interested. I don't think we can go through all of them, um, but I do want to mention how you can run Rapids if you're interested before we get to those slides. Um, and then I'll point you to the website that you can access all the most of the slides that I mentioned today. So I'll just pause here. Any questions, Yassi? I know I don't see any questions in the chat. Again, I encourage uh, audience to ask questions. Great. That would help me to take a little break too. <laughs> but no problem. We can do that at the end. Uh, so let's continue with KuGraph. Uh, what it is, it's basically a collection of graph algorithms. What we've been doing is we're taking in graph. If you've heard of it or familiar with it, we move that over to Rapids. Uh, we're also adding some additional algorithms too. What KuGraph does is it actually unifies some of the GPU accelerated graph analytics libraries like NVGraph, GoodRock, and Hornet. So we're collaborating with different groups at universities too. Um, Hornet for example, is out of Georgia Tech and Gunrock out of UC Davis. Uh, one interesting thing about graphs is that they're very dependent on interconnects too. So once you start spreading them out, it can slow down and decrease your overall performance. But in return, it's also a really good, good use case for NVLink, which is basically a high speed GPU to GPU. So our initial benchmarks, we've been comparing with CPUs and depending on the data size, we've seen up to 500x improvement by loading and processing graphs on the GPU. So using KuDF for data loading and pre-processing and then KuGraph for graph analytics. And if you're familiar with Network X, the API should look familiar too. Um, so again, similar um, idea with, a, uh, with the APIs. I'll just skip this so we have time to get to some of the other slides. Um, again, another benchmark that we ran PageRank, which is one of the popular graph algorithms to measure relative importance between links and connections. Uh, for this benchmark, we really used uh, RMAT datasets, and we uh, ran this on a DGX2 with 16V 100s that are connected through NVMe, which is basically 300 gigabytes of GPU uh, to GPU bandwidth and total aggregate of three. 4.8 terabytes, um, and then we compare this to 100 CPU nodes with the high bench benchmark. Um, so it took about an hour and a half compared to 30 seconds on the 16. Um, again, a table with some of the algorithms that are available today. For example, PageRank, breakfast search, single source shortest path. Um, most of these run on single GPU today, but we're working on multi. All right, so how can you use the software? How can you get the um, install Rapids? Uh, we have containers available on NGC uh, or NVIDIA's, uh, which is uh, a container repository that we actually publish. Uh, so you can access the containers there. Uh, we also publish this on Docker Hub, so another place that you can download uh, the Docker containers for bare metal. Um, if you want to use Rapids through Conda, that's another way, and it's usually the easiest way to install it onto your machine. We also release a nightly builds, so if you want to work on the latest development branch, that's usually, you can pull the nightlies. The good thing about that is if you're looking uh, for a pull request, whether it got merged or not, and if you want to test it, you don't have to build from source, you can just pull the nightly. Uh, but again, all of this is also available uh, on GitHub, so you can download it too and build from source if you want to. And so if you go to the website, which is rapids.ai, you'll see the interactive installation guide too, which I think is pretty cool. I use it too. Um, you can choose, you know, uh, how the method that you want to install it. You can choose the release that you're looking for, whether you want to use or nightly. 
Um, and then the packages that you want to install, whether you want to install all of Rapids or just some of the specific ones like QDF, QML. Um, and then it'll just give you the command to copy and paste and you'll be able to install it. Uh, here's the GitHub link. So on GitHub, if you again go to Rapids AI, you'll be able to see all of these repositories. Um, some of the additional ones that I didn't go through, Coo Signal, Coo Spatial, um, you'll see our Cloud ML Examples repo on there as well. But again, because everything is open source, you'll be able to go through all the code. Um, we do have notebook examples too. So if you want to look at some of these, that's usually a good way to get started. We have some multi-GPU examples, some multi-node examples too, for different data sets, use cases. Um, there are a couple of prerequisites to run Rapids, um, either on bare metal or in a Docker container. What you would need is a Pascal GPU or newer, so Pascal, Volta, or Ampere. Uh, right now with .17, you should be able to use CUDA 10.1, 10.2, and 11. Like I said, we'll release 18 soon, either today or tomorrow. Um, so we're starting to support newer CUDA versions, potentially I think 11.2 soon. And once we do that, we deprecate the older ones. Um, and then again, Ubuntu and CentOS version, Docker version if you're using Docker images. Uh, so this is what, just an example that we do collaborate with different groups and researchers. Uh, one group that we've been working with is at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, we're working to port some of their existing workflows and use cases that they're interested to run. Use. Uh, one project that I don't have the time or the expertise to go into the details, uh, but you can check that out. Um, it was re related to COVID-19 research. They presented it um, at Supercomputing as well as one of the COVID-19 coordinate bills. They're, what they're doing is they're looking for the right chemical stru structure that binds to uh, COVID-19 and this viral protein, and then figure out what will prevent the virus from attaching or replicating. So basically they want to screen drug candidates. They need to screen billions of molecules. So they're using a software called Autodoc on the GPU, which will allow them really to evaluate these molecules about 200 times faster than CPU. And they're running this on all of Summit, which is around 27,000 B100s. So they're able to monitor more than 25,000 molecules per second. And then after that, after they have the output of that software, they're using Rapids to really organize, search through, and analyze terabytes of data that they've generated through Autodoc. Um, I should mention that they're actually using Blazing SQL, which is a SQL engine on GPUs built on top of Rapids, um, but underneath, again, is still Rapids and Dask. So this was uh, really there to give them the ability to create an interactive analysis tool for querying and analyzing their data set, which they weren't able to do with some of the conventional and persistent databases. Um, and so just a couple other examples, but this is, I think, the one that they recently worked on, um, and, it, and it's pretty exciting. So it's been a long collaboration, and we'd like to, you know, hear more about some of the use cases that you might have as well and where we can. Um, and so, again, if you're interested, feel free to join our Slack channel. Um, most of us are on that. Um, so most of the engineers and developers, if you have questions, feel free to ask them there. If you have any issues, you can submit those on GitHub PRs, feature requests on GitHub as well. And I do have a couple of slides, well, a few on Dask on GPUs which we won't have the time to go through all of them, but I just want to briefly mention it in case anyone is interested in using DAS or if you've already been using DAS on CPUs, uh, just to mention how we're extending this with Rapids as well. So like I mentioned earlier, we use DAS to scale all the Rapids libraries. It's a pure Python API and a pure Python API scheduler for working with distributed computing it's an orchestrator. It coordinates all the work that's happening in a distributed fashion. And some of the benefits of Dask really is that um, this the Python interface. So it's a distributed scheduler, but it has a Python interface that's really built to scale Python workflows. 
It can work on your laptop, which is really nice, and you can use similar code to run on a supercomputer as well. It's also very modular, meaning that it separates scheduling, compute, IO, and some of the other things, which gives you the ability to test these comp components separately and independently as well. You can also have uh, multiple workers on a given node. So we usually recommend to use one worker per GPU, which is re really great for GPU utilization. And then these workers can communicate with each other to share data, and this can remove any central bottlenecks for data transfer. Um, some of the other reasons that we started looking into DAS, it's actually a PyData native used by a lot of data scientists. It allows single-threaded Python libraries like Pandas and NumPy to leverage all CPU cores. And since it uses some of these existing Python APIs and data structures, it's usually easy to integrate. And you can switch between, let's say, Pandas and Scikit-Learn to the DASC equivalent. So it can be deployed in different environments, whether it's HPC, on the cloud, and it can support complex scheduling as well, which is necessary for um, some of the more sophisticated algorithms used in, for example, machine learning, image processing, and statistics. And so DASC was around before RAPID, and what we wanted to do is we took the same exact paradigm and wrote it to leverage GPUs. So now with DASC and RAPID, you're, uh, you can partition your Python jobs across multiple nodes and multiple GPUs. Um, another thing to mention, this is again still pretty new, we're working on it, but traditionally DASC uses TCP to communicate. It's a Python native, and TCP is usually the standard way that a lot of these Python applications communicate. However, we know that TCP um, is reliable, but it can also be very slow. So communication can become a bigger bottleneck as we accelerate some of our computation on the GPU. So OpenUCX really is a project that provides a uniform API around some of these high-performance networking libraries like um, InfiniBand, uh, some of the traditional networking protocols too, like TCP, shared memory, and then GPU-specific protocols like MVLink. So it figures out which networking system to use. And to get high-performance networking in Dask as well, we wrapped UCX with Python and then connected that to Dask. So this led us to create UCX Pi, which is a Python wrapper around the UCX C library, and it provides, again, a Pythonic API. So now with DASC and UCX, we can scale on GPUs with hardware-aware communication. So for example, if we look at DASC Visual Dashboard, um, it looks something like this. This is an example of running a matrix decomposition workload. Um, in this dashboard, uh, there's different colors, that means different parts of the workflow. It's actually really a nice uh, tool to figure out what part of your workload is running, uh, what's happening with each one of these workers, so we sometimes use it as a profiling tool as well. Uh, but basically the main point of this slide is, at this, in this top chart, you see a lot of red, which means communication. And it actually makes sense for distributed matrix decomposition, since you have to send matrices around. It's expensive, it can take a lot of time. The bottom chart is really the same workload, but with UCX. So similar computation, uh, but now we can send these matrices around much faster, and this is one of the reasons that we're super excited about DASC and UCX. All right, so with how does this look? Um, if we want to compare this to these APIs, you can use um, RAPIS on single node um, to um, accelerate some of the pandas and NumPy um, code on the GPU. So you can think of it as a scaling up. And then if you want to scale out on multiple nodes and multi-GPUs, you can use RAPIS and DASC uh, for larger scale problems. Um, like I mentioned, DASC also scales CPU libraries. It's used for multi-core and multi-node scaling. And with Rapids and DASC, we're running on the GPUs with similar APIs. Um, so as long as these are similar, this should also look very similar to DASC as well. All right, so this was just an example. I, went, I won't go through all of the... Uh, 
And let's see. Um, I'll, I'll just pause here to show this dashboard too that I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's actually really nice. Um, it, like I said, we use it as a v visual debugging tool sometimes too. Um, it, it helps you understand what's happening. Um, red sometimes can mean that we're holding the data in memory that can be used for later. Um, and, and, and so this is, let's say we're using local cluster. So this is running on a single node with um, eight GPUs, I believe. Uh, so this is a DGX1. Um, and then you can open some of these other uh, tools for uh, monitoring your GPU memory utilization on the side too, and the DAS task stream, which shows you uh, where the progress is with this. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in using a similar uh, tool, it's basically the DAS extension um, and then NV dashboard extension that you can install them through um, Conda, or if you pull the Rapids container, these have already All right, so I'm just going to stop here uh, to take any questions, um, and we can discuss any of these topics in more detail. Yeah, so thank you, Zahra. So we do have a couple of questions. So one of them is, what are the trade-offs and overheads with using Rapids? Um, okay, so that, that's a good question. Um, I want to say overhead, and I'm assuming you mean comparing to maybe C. Um, we really, the only overhead that I can think of is if your data is small, and in small, I mean maybe a few megabytes, um, and if you want to train on the GPU, want to run some of your pre-processing on the GPU, you might not see great acceleration. The reason for that is there's a little bit of overhead to transfer your data from CPU to GPU as well. And then you're not fully utilizing your GPUs. Uh, so for small data sets, it might not make sense. But anything other than that, um, when you get in the gigabytes or the terabytes or even a few hundred megabytes, um, we haven't really seen like a downside or um, additional overhead. Thanks. And the other questions I believe has already been answered, which is related to um, the availability of graphics on Volta GPUs or any task calls, which I think the answer was yes. The other thing that it just came in is, can graphics be used for both OpenMP and OpenACC interfaces? Hmm. That, that, that's a good question. Uh, we, we do not... Our implementations are all in C++. Um, so, and it's usually for data science code that everyone is already using Python. So, um, I don't think it can be applied to some of those codes. Um, if you're using OpenACC or OpenMP, um, I'm assuming those can be uh, traditional HPC applications. Um, so, so Rapids is mostly for, you know, Python libraries or uh, some of these existing tools that were just running on the CPUs until now. I will say though, uh, some of the, like Kupai that I mentioned, these fall, uh, they're not necessarily part of Rapids, but part of the whole ecosystem that we are working with different teams that you know work on GPU as well. So I don't want to claim all of it as part of um, NVIDIA, but it's part of the Rapids um, ecosystem. Thank you. Um, are we uh, are we close to be uh, done with the presentation of slides? Yes. That, so that's the last slide that I have. Up. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, obviously, I want to let all the audience know that we will share the slides with you. Um, and when Zahra shared them with me, I will send an email to everyone, and you can get the copy of the slides. I would like to encourage everyone, if you guys have questions, please go ahead and you can simply unmute yourself at this time and just ask the questions. One thing that I uh, do want to mention, I'll share the slides uh, with you uh, so you can send it to the group, uh, but it's also, 
most of these and even more uh, are available um, on our website as well and we update it with each release. Let me see if I can just pull this up. Oh, we have a little bit of so well, maybe if you just share the link to the website, I can share that as well. There you well go. I'm sure the slides. That sounds good. Uh, sorry, I joined a little late. Um, can you explain quickly uh, how does the acceleration happen? I mean, what is, in a nutshell, what is the underlying mechanism of the acceleration? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, all of it is in CUDA C++ underneath. Um, so that's what we're doing to parallelize a lot of these algorithms and for the some of these existing codes from CPU to GPU. Uh, where this is different is that we're writing these Python wrappers that users that are familiar with Python, and if they don't want to write CUDA C++ or not familiar with it at all, don't have to worry about it. Um, but still, we're, it's, it's all GPU programming underneath still, um, so nothing has changed there. 